Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. We are in Galveston, Texas at Pier 21, which is right across the, the Galveston Shipping Channel from Gulf Copper Shipyard, where the Battleship Texas went into dry dock uh, yesterday, August 31st, 2022. Uh, might not be yesterday by the time you're watching this video, but uh, we are filming this on September 1st. So, Texas is in a floating dry dock. And uh, we've gotten a lot of questions on the channel in some of the stuff that we've posted lately about how this works, what's going on with this. Uh, so, floating dry docks uh, are essentially other ships that can carry vessels, uh, or sometimes more accurately described as barges uh, because they don't necessarily have their own power. I don't believe this one uh, can sail on her own. She has to be tugged around by a towboat. Uh, but as opposed to a more traditional dry dock or graving dock where you would dig out a part of land uh, and then put a, a uh, door there that you could sail a ship into, close the door, pump all the uh, water out, and now your ship is high and dry. A floating dry dock gets towed to where it's needed, it gets submerged, you sail your ship onto it, and then it is buoyant enough because you see the two wing walls, the two sides, how they're rectangle, uh, rectangular, those are filled with uh, void spaces. You pump out the water in those and it can not only lift the own dry dock, uh, it'll lift the 30,000 tons of dreadnought that are in it. Uh, this particular floating dry dock was designed for the large cruise ships that operate down in the Caribbean. So it, it's even built for ships larger than Texas herself. Uh, so it's buoyant enough to lift all that up. Uh, some floating dry docks, especially World War II era US Navy ones, even have like a bow on them or, uh, and workshops inside of them, engines to, to propel themselves around. Uh, so for example, when we dry docked the sailing ship Constellation back in 2016-ish, uh, I think, uh, back when I was still working down in Baltimore, we put her into a World War II era floating dry dock at the Coast Guard Yard at Curtis Bay outside of Baltimore, uh, the USS Oak Ridge. It had been a World War II era floating dry dock, and there were uh, workshop spaces in there, as well as these wing tanks. There were birthing compartments, a galley, an engine room, uh, you name it. This was a ship that could carry other ships. Uh, and I think it is worth pointing out this type of ship because battleships, aircraft carriers, destroyers, submarines, they get all the credit. But the reason we were able to win World War II was the fleet train that got these ships there. A battleship like Texas has a range of about 10,000 nautical miles. But zigzagging, expecting to fight a battle, and then having to sail back to port limits that range to about 2,000 nautical miles, or the distance from one island group to the next. So it meant that the U.S. Navy could not project power effectively all the way across the Pacific to attack mainland Japan. Many of the small island groups that we fought with the Japanese over in the Central Pacific uh, were completely uh, underdeveloped. They had indigenous peoples living there, but those peoples did not have heavy industry and shipyards and things like that. The Japanese had built up some of these facilities across the Pacific, and those were the most heavily defended places in the Pacific. So rather than going and island hopping onto those and losing a lot of Marines in the process of taking them, we took the island next to it that was completely empty, and then we brought up the fleet train, all of these auxiliaries, oilers, floating dry docks, repair ships, uh, ships that are not frontline combatants, but that can maintain these frontline combatants in a forward deployed area. Uh, so the, the same exact ships are able to fight through campaign to campaign to campaign. In fact, uh, we were so good at keeping our ships forward deployed that we had to rotate out staff to plan the next campaign. So Admirals Halsey and Spruance were both in command of the same fleet of ships, and they alternated that command. When Halsey was in charge, it was third fleet. When he goes home to plan the next invasion, Spruance comes in and takes fifth fleet and does the next invasion, and then Halsey leapfrogs him, Spruance leapfrogs that. We change the name of the fleet each time. So the Japanese don't know how many ships we actually have fighting the war. First they're fighting third fleet, and then fifth fleet comes in. Well, it's the same ships, it's the same crew. It's just a different admiral uh, coming in with new ideas. He's been able to think about the next action while the other guy was focused on what's happening right now. Uh, 
And these ships are able to keep doing that forward deployed because of things like the floating dry docks. So major bases like uh, Eniwetok Atoll, um, which had nothing ahead of time except a decent sheltered deep water anchorage, are able to be uh, stocked with these other ships to have all the support facilities needed for the fleet to just continue pushing closer and closer to Japan. Uh, so that allows the United States Navy to maintain an incredibly high operational tempo against the Japanese uh, to the point that the Japanese have difficulty learning the lessons from the last campaign in time to institute them for the next campaign. They have trouble replacing the ships, the aircraft, and the trained personnel uh, in time to fight the next campaign. So when we shoot down all the Japanese aircraft in the Sullivan, uh, Solomon's uh, Islands campaign, by the Battle of the Philippine Sea, they don't have trained pilots. We shoot all them down. Uh, they're, they were under-trained compared to their American counterparts. Well, then we go into the next series of campaigns, the Philippines and Okinawa, Iwo Jima. The Japanese don't even have pilots, planes, and ships to throw at us, so they start launching kamikaze missions, uh, really last-ditch things. And those are deadly uh, to both the Japanese and the Americans, but uh, it is far less deadly than a successful dive bombing attack or torpedo attack if, if Japan had the resources to fight a uh, first line kind of defense like they had been able to put on early in the war when things were really in question. So, uh, has an Iowa class battleship ever been in a floating dry dock? Uh, off the top of my head, I can think of at least one instance of this. After Halsey's typhoon in December 44 off the Philippines, Iowa is damaged enough that she needs to go into a floating dry dock. Um, so she receives repairs in that. There were floating dry docks that were big enough to take the largest ships in the fleet, the Iowas, all the way down to submarines and destroyers. Uh, there's even a great picture of a floating dry dock that's able to hold two battleships. I want to say off the top of my head it's Tennessee and California, but we're going to throw that picture on the screen now. You can see that they've got them both wedged in the same floating dry dock. Uh, I just think that's the coolest thing. Uh, each one is about two-thirds the length of an Iowa. When Iowa uh, is in a floating dry dock, her bow and stern hang over the edges. Much like uh, Texas is longer than the floating dry dock she's in, and they've actually brought another dry dock up in front of her to uh, support the bow of the ship that overhangs on the other side of the bay. And we didn't get in the shipyard to get a picture of that yet. Um, so floating dry docks are incredibly important to the U.S. Navy, uh, and similar sorts of things are able to be done still in the modern Navy. So for example, uh, in my lifetime when USS Cole is bombed and they blow a monster truck sized hole in the side of the ship, they're able to set her on a uh, heavy lift ship and sail her across the ocean, uh, across the Atlantic, back to the United States so she can be repaired. Likewise, Samuel B. Roberts, Stark, uh, ships like the uh, John S. McCain Sr. Uh, that gets into a collision off uh, Japan in the last couple of years. All of these things are able to be uh, raised and repaired so they can make it back to a major shipyard. So what do you think is the most important unsung type of ship of World War II? Uh, I, I really think floating dry docks don't get enough uh, credit for how they allowed the US Navy to maintain its high operational tempo. But let me know your thoughts down in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. Uh, instead of supporting Battleship New Jersey, consider supporting USS Texas while she's in dry dock here. There's a link in the description below uh, to donate to them and another link to their YouTube channel where they're making videos about the work that's going on on the ship. So if you're interested in what they're doing, uh, head over there and check them out. This will support both of our channels because it increases awareness in us. So please do that, and uh, thank you guys for watching.